Ah, good. The sound is better now, according to Salman. Thank you, Salman. Uh, so that indicates it may be... Uh, it may be a problem on my end. end. Yes, I do apologize. Um, so perhaps what I can do is I'm going to actually hand it over to you and basically let you give something of a presentation and I'll try and edit the <laughs> okay. um, sort of video afterwards. So yeah, if we it's can always right. remove the first, yeah. yeah. So uh, Salman, when you say it's better, hopefully mean that means it's good <laughs> because the bar is pretty low. Uh, but in any case, uh, those of you who are still with us, uh, those uh, among posterity who will listen to the recording, and apologies to the author for the inconvenience. It's not the best way to start off an episode, but in any case, uh, revealed sciences, natural sciences, in Islam, in Morocco in the 17th century. This is a very important work and uh, comprised of a preface and introduction, four body chapters uh, with four ex excursions, which are brief, uh, you know, half dozen page essays really reflecting on methodological questions and, uh, and then a conclusion and uh, some useful appendices as well. Um, what is the main intervention the book is making because he is looking at a particular case study a fairly narrow context of um, Morocco uh, in the 17th century although he often kind of zooms out and explores uh, the 16th to 18th centuries um, this is really um, an attempt to prize the history of science in an Islamic context uh, from uh, theological narratives of the rise of Western science. Uh, what do I mean by that? Um, often it has been the case that historians of science have disregarded uh, periods and contributions and authors and texts and genres uh, that in their own contexts have been perfectly intellectually respectable, like astrology, according to Stearns in the 17th century context, um, simply because they have not uh, been part of the the genealogical narrative of, of the rise of Western science. So you can sort of see the book as a corrective to this. Um, the first chapter kind of makes this methodological intervention uh, very clear. Um, and the introduction uh, is about uh, narratives of the history of science, old and new. He frequently invokes Thomas Kuhn, although he, he does uh, problem problematize aspects of his thesis in his 1962 si Structure of Scientific Re Revolutions. But he keeps returning to the metaphor uh, that uh, Kuhn invokes, uh, the Darwinian um, tree of life. So Darwin uh, spoke of biological evolution as a tree uh, that you know gr grew from a trunk and grew and developed branches that continue to grow outwards. Uh, but it is not uh, a kind of teleological growth. It doesn't have a telos or end goal. And it is not purposive. So um, he suggests we should understand the history of science in the same way. And once we do, this has a tremendous impact on what we view as significant or deserving of study. And the book repeats multiple times the call to understand, uh, in this particular context, the history of science in uh, 17th century Marco on its own terms. And that involves the study of branches of knowledge, such as alchemy, astrology, and so on, uh, that really, at least according to a triumphalist Western account of the history of science, uh, don't really have a bearing, as I said, on this uh, really first half of the 20th century narrative of a scientific revolution. Um, the, f the four chapters, uh, how, how do they look? So the first chapter is um, a discussion really of the institutional and political and social contexts of the study of the natural sciences in 17th century Morocco. Uh, and it, it begins with a kind of potted political history of uh, North Africa, beginning with the conquests, uh, 
uh, in the seventh century, continue on to the Adresids and so on, and I'll kind of break that down further once we've uh, finished the, the introduction. Uh, and I think uh, one of Stern's most uh, interesting and for me surprising contributions is um, the emphasis on uh, Zawaya or Sufi Zawiyas, and in particular the role of rural uh, institutions. He met, he, among others, he mentions the Dila uh, Zawiya in uh, the High Atlas and the Nasiri Zawiya uh, in, uh, on the edge of the Sahara. Now we tend to associate the production of Islamic uh, learning with uh, urban centers. Uh, and the, the major role played by uh, rural areas, I mean, especially these two that offer kind of advanced Islamic education, does uh, relativize to a great extent the role of urban centers. And the major scholar, uh, long-standing interest uh, or research interest of uh, Dr. Stearns, uh, Al-Hassan al yusi dies in 1102-1691 of the Common Era, uh, spent his career basically in these uh, rural uh, Sufi institutions, even though he was never fully accepted by um, the scholars of Fez. Um, he was uh, popular with the rulers and attracted their patronage and indeed many, many students. And he plays a kind of oversized role in the history of um, knowledge in, in, this, in this context and in this period. So that's the first chapter, uh, kind of laying the institutional and social um, background, I suppose, of the study. Um, and then there, there's, as I said, the short excursus after each chapter, typically it's, it's an essay of half a dozen pages or so. And the first one explores the poverty of uh, the history of science as a, a kind of an intellectual history, generally as a history of great men, um, a kind of fact that uh, Stern's struggles with and, and short to foreground throughout the narrative is the fact that the overwhelming majority of sources we're dealing with um, are sitting in, in manuscript uh, repositories and manuscript libraries, private and public collections, and indeed uh, across multiple continents. Um, in the fourth chapter, he does turn to uh, what he calls at some point in the book, the political economy, no, the political economy of textual accessibility, something like that. In my opinion, a felicitous phrase, if I've remembered it rightly. In the fourth chapter, he um, surveys the, roughly speaking, the, the holdings of 28 Moroccan manuscript libraries. Um, I added up the figures of manuscripts. Each contains a rough figure of something like 104,213 manuscripts. So we're talking really about a ginormous intellectual output put only a fraction of which has been published. Uh, that's something emphasized in the fourth, uh, fourth chapter. So to some extent, we're hostage to our lack of access to the sources. So original work will necessarily entail going to manuscript libraries as Stans has done uh, over the course of many years. Uh, thank you, thank you to him for his efforts in that regard. Um, and uh, partly because of this lack of access, as he says in the first excursus, we are especially vulnerable to these pressures of painting this intellectual history of the post-classical period in particular, which he says uh, roughly 13th to 18th centuries, um, on which there has been some work, um, especially East Mediterranean and uh, Central Asia, but very little on the Maghreb. Some work has been done on Andalus, he says. Uh, but we're hostage to these uh, kind of historiographical pressures, you know, the notion of decline, uh, something that has been internalized in the Muslim world, you know, by reformist figures in the, in the, late, in the late 19th century and on certain key points, the origin of science and um, this kind of reformist narrative uh, advocated by people like the Moroccan independence activist and founder of the Istiqlal Party, Alal al-Fasi, dies in 1974, I think. Um, th this idea that we, there's a great deal of kind of dross in the past that we have to discard while strategically adopting the European sciences to advance. Um, yeah, so uh, the first chapter, as I said, is this intellectual and social history. Um, <laughs> always a struggle with my memory. The second chapter is really about um, the structuring of knowledge uh, 
and the place of the natural sciences therein, if I'm not mistaken, in the 16th to 18th centuries in Morocco. And this uh, chapter has a roughly tripartite structure. Uh, Stearns explores seven tabaqat works, including um, uh, this one of Muhammad al kattani Salwal and first dies in 1927, I believe. Uh, but seven tabaqat works, um, and uh, about a dozen faharis, and I'll explain what that means shortly. Uh, it's kind of like an intellectual autobiography. Faharis as the singular plural is faharis, and also um, three kind of major typologies of the sciences in this period. Uh, especially the one of Al Hassan Al Yusi in his work Al Qanun, which explores the various kinds of knowledge and the correct comportment or etiquette of its bearers. Um, also, um, the uh, Kitab Uqnum, Kitab Al Uqnum fi Mabad Al Ulum of uh, Abd Rahman Al Fasi, who dies in 1685, and the uh, Bulugh Aqsal Murad fi Sharaf al Ilm of Al Turun Bati, who dies in 1799. Anyway, and uh, the Faharis are also interesting. Um, now, what, what kind of does he establish in the second chapter? Some of his key findings. I mean, he's exploring these uh, important biographical dictionaries. And how, how are they kind of depicting the authority of the natural uh, sciences? I should say that there isn't much of a discussion of what the natural sciences are. I guess this is a widely accepted category, so it doesn't really need lots of interrogation. He often speaks of the natural sciences and the mathematical sciences, and very occasionally speaks of the philosophical sciences, but you know, um, this is the kind of territory we're discussing in the book. Most of the time, it's, uh, the focus is strictly on the natural sciences. And um, the biographical dictionaries show that typically, you know, from the let's say 16th to 18th century, maybe between 8 and 9% on average of uh, scholars in Morocco, in the Moroccan context, studied one or more of these rational sciences. Um, so yes, it was a minority pursuit, but certainly a well-established one. And these were regarded as legitimate and authoritative sciences. Some of them occasionally were contested, particularly alchemy, to which I'll, I'll return a bit more um, in the past. Um, and uh, but they were well established. They were regarded as reputable and so on. And they were they were cultivated. I mean, this is one of the major findings of the book. As I said, out of the um, 104,213 manuscripts, I mean, I, I guess that's not titles. That's actually number of manuscripts. So duplicate titles certainly exist. Um, in the period of uh, the 17th century, as he discusses in the fourth chapter. We're talking about about 120 works in the natural and mathematical sciences. This is a discussion in the fourth chapter. Um, of those 120, I mean, um, uh, 72 are in astronomy and astrology, 27 are in medicine, 10 are in uh, letterism, and 5 are in alchemy. So that gives you a sense of the prominence of various sciences. Uh, and um, I should emphasize Stearns in the first chapter, or perhaps even in, in the introduction, uh, in the introduction indeed, acknowledges uh, three kind of major scholarly interventions that have shaped his work, and uh, which his work is in conversation with Khaled or Wahib's book on the 17th century, and indeed his work on uh, logic, I guess that perhaps it's the uh, work on relational syllogisms, which shows the continued vitality of the rational sciences you know, all throughout the post-classical period. He, he also has this, almost a biographical dictionary of logicians, 1500 to 1800, I believe. Um, and uh, again, Ruwayhib, uh, he talks about three major intellectual movements in his book on the 17th century, but I need not detain you with the details. Um, and uh, Matt Melvin Kushki and his work, which we've mentioned in previous episodes, Kushki mounts what uh, Stearns characterizes as a frontal assault on the intellectual history of the post-classical Islamic world and calls for a kind of decolonization of this field, which is um, pervaded by uh, and often dominated by these at least implicit assumptions of 
um, you know, what is useful science, what, what contributes to this kind of teleology of, uh, of Western science, which according to which, uh, you know, Western science is basically the culmination of the history of science. But also um, one of Kushki's key interventions, something that um, Stuns really gives evidence to, to, to reinforce, is he reinscribes the importance of the esoteric and Cossacks um, in Islamic intellectual history, not to deny that sciences like letterism and alchemy weren't contested, of course they were, but um, this contestation has been somewhat overstated, as in the case of Ibn Khaldun and, and the science of letterism. They were, in the post-classical period, intellectually respectable, mainstream. Uh, we mentioned in a previous episode on Pickett's, uh, James Pickett's book, uh, Polymaths of Islam, that he estimates uh, with Kushki that around 5% of Bukharan scholars were cultivating the, the occult sciences. So again, it's a minority pursuit, but it is being cultivated. It is, it is regarded as intellectually respectable. And finally, third intervention, uh, the work of Sonia Brentes on uh, teaching and learning uh, the sciences in uh, the Islamic world to 1700. What's her key intervention? She demonstrates contra George Muktasi in his classical work on colleges uh, that, um, you know, the natural and mathematical sciences were being cultivated in institutional spaces like Medaris, you know, in, even in this post-classical period. Um, so another thing that um, stuns the cries is the, what, <laughs> what he regards as the overprivileging of Islamic law in an account of, you know, Islam as a, you know, Islamic culture and so on, uh, echoing uh, Shahab Ahmed and in, indeed others. Uh, something I, I think one could, uh, you know, one could contest. I mean, it, it's. I think it's possible to, to defend at least to some extent Shacht's ob famous observation that Islamic law is like the core and kernel of Islam. I'm not in a, this kind of essentialist way, but I mean, uh, Stearns points out that you know, eight to nine percent of Moroccan scholars, you know, uh, studied one or more of the rational sciences. How many of those scholars studied Islamic law? I would be surprised if the figure was substantially lower than 100%. 120 works or thereabouts um, in the natural sciences and mathematical sciences were written in the period Stern's examines. I mean, how much larger would the figure be if we looked at Islamic law? Maybe 100 times as large or dozens of times large anyway. Uh, but that's a separate discussion. So, um, that's for biographical dictionaries in chapter two. Um, as for the classificatory schemes, I mentioned the three key works. Uses is by far, El Uses is by far the most kind of systematic and well articulated. He draws mainly on the work of Ibn al Akfani, and he kind of makes a number of distinctions between different sciences. But the key thing, and this is a, again a key theme of the book, is as Yusi says in his, uh, I think it is Muhadarat or Discourses, the first volume of which has been translated by Stearns as part of the NYU Library of Arabic Literature, which I would recommend you all uh, look at. It's, I mean, his Arabic must be very good. Uh, it's not an easy work to understand or translate. Um, Al Yusi contests Ibn Jose, died 1340, and his. Uh, typology of the sciences. How? Ibn Jose uh, divides various branches of knowledge into three kinds, those that are uh, religiously sanctioned, his translation of Shari, those that are kind of instrumental sciences. Um, so the, the religiously san sanctioned or Shari sciences would be the ones dealing directly, one assumes, with texts of revelation, the Quran, Hadith, and so on. Instrumental sciences, I, I guess, are things like logic and grammar and so on. Uh, they're also listed, but not Shari in the same way. And uh, Ibn al uh, sorry, Ibn Jose's third category is the, the prohibited sciences. Um, uh, al Yusi collapses the distinction between instrumental sciences and Shari sciences, and he states, Kulluha Shari'iyya, in effect, uh, that anything, any branch of knowledge, even if it contains some flaws or some problematic elements, that entails benefits, temporal and otherworldly, for the Muslim community. Uh, these are Shari sciences. So you see, uh, Stern says, is really the kind of, seems to be the first person to frame 
this uh, so broadly and ambitiously. You know, the idea that um, not only the boundaries, uh, you know, in, in Morocco in this context between revealed and uh, and rational knowledge porous. I mean, for you, <laughs> it's really hard to distinguish them at all. And he uh, goes on to further add that um, uh, it's re whether or not they're permissible is really a matter of the student and presumably the teacher's intention. So even the study of sorcery or sihr is licit, for example, if the student wants to learn how to defend against it, which is an argument I think uh, Shafi'i is makes or is attributed to Shafi'i. Uh, anyway, it's, it's also a very interesting subject, of course. And as for Faharis, the third uh, discussion of chapter two, uh, this is a distinctively Maghrebi phenomenon. The first example we have, I can't remember if uh, Stearns points out that it's extant or not, is by Ibn al-Qali, who dies in 365, who's actually a, a migrant to the Maghrib. And uh, Stearns kind of surveys about a dozen of these, um, again, with an interest in depicting how exactly um, the um, natural uh, sciences and um, and religious sciences kind of interweave and how their authority uh, kind of interpenetrates. Chapter 3 is really on the relationship and, and sorry, uh, the second excursus um, is uh, <laughs> something I will uh, second excursus so the first excursus, as I said, is on the poverty of the history of science as a history of great men. And uh, the fourth excursus is on uh, the spiritual life and Sufism and esotericism and how the natural sciences relate to this. The second, uh, I've remembered, is on causality. And uh, the third I will come to after discussing the third chapter. Um, the second excursus on causality, the the third, of course, uh, now it comes to me, is on uh, Thomas Kuhn and the history of uh, Islamic and history of science. So in the second ex excursus, you know, again, the historiography of Islamic science has been plagued by this uh, kind of pressure of uh, this teleological narrative, the rise of Western science, that kind of disregards the importance of other branches of learning, anything that doesn't contribute to, to this teleo teleological narrative. Um, and uh, the history of Asharite occasionalism, or the, how, how it's kind of conceptualized and understood in, in the academy is, is, a, is another victim of this teleological narrative. Um, Yusi himself suggests that um, there are kind of three ways to approach the asbab, or kind of uh, natural causation, if you like. Of course, as a good Asharite, he denies that there is such a thing or that things inherently possess particular properties, although he does acknowledge, as are the Asharites do, causal mechanisms that are kind of God's habit or ada that take place most of the time. And he says that the best of these three attitudes, one of which uh, ignores God's omnipotence and his you know, causing of, of, of things in the natural world, the other attitude which disregards the asbab, you know, a kind of Sufi tawakkul, if you like. He says the superior attitude is the third, which honors the asbab, if you like, as signs of God's um, omnibenevolence and um, enduring wisdom. So it's only if one views uh, causation and causality as entirely stripped of supernatural elements that one can um, kind of dismiss it actually entertaining, you know, an occasionalist thesis doesn't mean disregarding causation or causality. Um, it's just a way of appreciating God's, God's action in, uh, and God's imminence in, in a world of kind of natural causes. So this is how Stuns frames it. Third chapter, as I said, really explores um, the relationship of law and the natural uh, sciences and how, how this relationship works out. It's kind of got a roughly bipartite structure. Um, that is the first section uh, looks at the 15th to 19th uh, century, exploring three key Maliki Maghrabi fatwa works. Uh, the fatwa of Al-Burzuli, who dies in uh, 1438, the Fatawa of Elwan Sharisi, the famous Ma'yar, uh, 
who dies in 1508, and the Ma'yar al-Jadid, uh, on which Sa'ati Taram has written the short book of al-Mahdi al-Wazani, who dies in, I think, 1923. Uh, collectively, these amount to more than, you know, more than 8,000 printed pages, and Stearns has only found a few dozen kind of occasional references to the natural uh, sciences in this vast corpus of Atau. I mean, not simply the work of these authors, they've in fact compiled uh, the, 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 the fatawa of dozens and dozens, you know, even hundreds of, uh, of Maghrabi jurists, you know, everyone from Ashatabi to Qadi Ayad to, you know, many others, and their own, their own works indeed are included. Um, and uh, the second uh, part of chapter three looks at the great tobacco debate, which I will revisit shortly. So third chapter, as we've seen in the episode on Junaid Qadri's book, there's actually no equivalence or at least for pre-modern jurists, between establishing um, prayer times using astronomical instruments, which most jurists did not regard as controversial. Wazani um, is critical of a jurist who says that one should not use such methods. And uh, this, this jurist who is, um, ah, better again, good. This jurist who is critical of the use of the astrolabe and other methods. Gosh, is this... This is Al Wazani. Um, he is a kind of Khalili, he's advocate of Muhtasar al Khalil. Stearns mentions, for, interestingly, that Khalil and his Muhtasar uh, criticizes the Munajimun in the chapter on uh, Ramadan, but um, does not mention astronomers or astronomical methods. In uh, the chapter on uh, prayer times, he mentions the, the use of a stick. The, I mean, this is because the, for, for pre-modern jurists, these two things weren't equivalent. As I said, most uh, jurists, with exceptions in the pre-modern period, like uh, Subki, Tajuddin Subki, or I always confuse Taj and Taqiyuddin, but anyway, one of them, permitted astronomical methods for establishing the, the, the beginning of the month of Ramadan for people who were specialists in that area. The use of um, such methods to establish prayer times was not generally controversial as far as I know, some contestation, but, you know, compared to Ramadan, where the great majority of jurists don't seem to have accepted it in, until the modern period. Um, anyway, another case discussed is uh, Qadi Ayad, as cited by al Sharif. And his kind of anxious Mustafti is asking, well, how does one rec reconcile the Prophet's command, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, to give alms and pray and increase in fear of God and so on uh, when eclipses are occurring, when, you know, astronomers can, um, can uh, predict these with accuracy and can predict their duration. Qadi um, Ayyad does mention that uh, some, uh, well, he said many, many jurists do contest accuracy of such Predictions. Hopefully, the sound is clear, guys. Let us know if it isn't. Yeah, uh, so we can uh, sort, sort this for next time. Okay. I'm currently in a sort of. I'm, I'm in New York, uh, New York State. <laughs> sure. Sure. Uh, but ultimately, how the others recognize the accuracy of such predictions? So it's, a case of, you know, he says prayer doesn't you know, stop the eclipse from happening or speed it up. He does accept compatibility of astronomical and, and religious uh, knowledge and so on. And then there's a um, discussion of it's not better you may to absent yourself again. And that's, that's fine. Just... So I will come in and maybe interject with questions occasionally. And sure. you'll be able to hear me. And then if you like, you can engage with questions. And sure. when you're done, I'll reconnect. Sure. There is a um, long discussion of alchemy and its advocates and detractors. Uh, yeah, th that's what I suspected each time with Emma comes out. <laughs> I'm afraid the sound is worse. Anyway, um, people who opposed it, including Ibn Sina, Ibn al Jawzi, Ibn Abdul Bar, but alchemy finds many advocates as well, um, not least. Yeah, I mean, many, many advocates. Anyway, um, the ch the second part of chapter three explores the great tobacco debate, a very um, hot topic in the 17th to 18th centuries. Tobacco comes to the Muslim majority world and indeed uh, 
Morocco in the late 16th century. And uh, the debate is vigorous, but uh, ultimately inconclusive. And Stearns kind of explores the uh, multiple perspectives on this issue, um, dominated by those who are critical uh, by, he says, the mid 17th century. Most jurists kind of either shun tobacco as problematic morally or at least something that should best be avoided. Uh, sure. Um, <laughs> really uh, do the heavy lifting of this one. I hope I don't mess up too much. Anyway. Um, yes, so uh, a number of kind of key interventions, including those of Ahmed Babat and Bukhti, the famous uh, West African scholar who spends time in, uh, in Morocco. Um, and he draws on Qarafi's discussion. Qarafi, of course, interested in hashish. He lives before the introduction of the back of the Muslim majority world. Um, Qarafi makes a threefold distinction endorsed by Ahmed Baba. Uh, between uh, muskirat or intoxicants, mufsidat, uh, which is translated as narcotics, and uh, is it uh, muhtirat? Anyway, uh, which um, are kind of uh, anesthetic or um, languor inducing or num numbness inducing substances. Um, for Qarafi, uh, this, these distinctions are key because. So the third excursus, as I said, explores uh, Kuhn, uh, Thomas Kuhn, and structure scientific revolutions in the context of Islamic science. I just gave a kind of um, quick explanation of Kuhn's notion of paradigms and normal science, which is what happens most of the time before a scientific model uh, is unable to account for certain problems, thinking of uh, Aristotelian Ptolemaic astronomy, uh, you know, uh, whose attempt to explain the motion, celestial motion becomes increasingly complex until it's uh, faced with a certain epistemic crisis and then a new paradigm emerges uh, therefrom and uh, producing a period of revolutionary science which would include figures like you know, Kepler and um, Galileo and Copernicus and so on. In any case, um, this is extremely relevant to the study of Islamic science uh, and the natural uh, sciences in post-classical Islamic history. Why? Because, um, as Stern says on page 180 of the book, and I, I really emphasize this in my notes and underlined it, uh, the text explored in <laughs> this book may not seem terribly original. Uh, I mean, there are... And he draws a lot on French and Arabic scholarship in this book, which is great. But, uh, you know, for a scholar like uh, Zach Beck, who died in 1995, and another scholar like uh, Mohammed Hadji, both of whom make very substantial contributions to Maghrebi intellectual history in the spirit. Uh, uh, Hadji dies in 2003, I believe. Um, uh, you know, there again buy into this idea that there is a lack of originality in this period. And to be honest, <laughs> reading Stan's book is something he, he's wary of and uh, mentions in the conclusion. It can be hard to escape, uh, hard to escape that, that conclusion. Yes, of course, the natural sciences were cultivated. Yes, they played a central role in intellectual life in Morocco in the 17th century in both rural and urban uh, centers of learning. Uh, yes, we must not be uh, kind of subject to the pressures of modernization theory and post-classical intellectual decline. But at the same time, uh, Stearns clearly acknowledges, I believe, that in this book we are operating within a period of normal, uh, normal science where the paradigms of Galenic medicine or humoral medicine, and um, he says the medicine of Paracelsus doesn't seem to feature heavily in, in Moroccan medicine this period, and the astronomy of Aristotle, Ptolemy, you know, none of these are challenged in any kind of serious and sustained way. So that, you know, revolutionary science is very sexy and exciting and, you know, very deeply inscribed as, as the kind of most important thing about science and this teleological narrative of the rise of Western science. But most science isn't, isn't like that, <laughs> necessarily so. Um, 
I should say, since I did mention that uh, Stearns draws heavily on both French and Arabic scholarship, which have made more contributions to the study of post-classical Maghrebi uh, intellectual history than English uh, language scholarship. And it's great to see him recognizing Moroccan authors uh, in particular, notwithstanding the fact that he says many of their works suffer from very limited print runs. Uh, you know, so there is a real problem of accessibility, even in uh, Western scholars at well-resourced institutions. Um, he mentions in particular the work of Qasim Simbalali, I believe it is, on alchemy in, uh, in Morocco in this period. And again, Simbalali emphasizes that alchemy is really cultivated in the Maghreb, you know, from the, um, from the uh, Almoravid uh, period, almost continuously. And uh, it is heavily contested as a science, there's a discussion really in chapter three, but it does have a certain prominence and it does have advocates, you know, major scholars uh, are its advocates. Um, anyway. Um, I'm, I'm going to uh, request that uh, I'm going to take a, a couple of minutes to restart my computer, see if that helps. But in in those couple of minutes, I hope you can sort of um, maybe continue to reflect on a few dimensions of the book. If you like, yeah. I can ask a question and then I will um, hopefully return um, sure. to pick up on what you're saying. Yeah, so he also mentions, I think, in the third excursus, it's a very interesting article by David Pingree I wasn't aware of called um, Hellenism, uh, sorry, Hellenophilia versus the history of science. Uh, Pingree's observation that astral science, uh, you know, if you think of, again, this tree of life diagram of Darwin, think of the sciences in those terms, the astral sciences have their taproot and trunk, Pingree says, in Mesopotamia, and then kind of branch out and reach China and and Greece and Egypt and so on. Western uh, science, you know, modern Western science as, uh, you know, understood um, in this 20th century narrative of the scientific revolution is, is really a very late growth of one particular branch of, uh, of the science. And, it, you know, it's successful. It, it destroys its competitors. I mean, largely displaces at least its competitors. And it becomes very hard to, for us to understand, Pingri says, what uh, Chinese or Islamic or Indian uh, sciences may have become had this not happened, had this displacement not happened and, and so on, had they not been kind of crushed by the competition. Um, and elsewhere, Stearns does talk about, um, you know, it takes a real, we're, we're so subject, so victim, so hostage to these historiographical pressures that it takes a real feat of imagination to kind of rethink ourselves in other shoes, you know, to, to go back to the 17th century when, when astrology was a perfectly respectable, um, you know, branch of learning uh, and was occasionally contested. I mean, I, I should say I've been looking at um, uh, astronomy and astrology in Western travelogues in the Muslim majority world from the early modern period to the 19th century. And, I think uh, <laughs> my own view, not to equate myself as Orientalism, uh, with Orientalism is best expressed by Karsten Niebuhr, who says that both the Quran and Quranic commentaries denounce astrological you know, prognostication. Of course, the Quran does not explicitly do so, but the, the Quranic commentaries certainly understand it. So if you look at Tabari, for instance, um, however, and he, he uses the word criminal or the English Uh -huh. or the English translation kind of characterizes as criminal, notwithstanding the fact that th this kind of uh, tafsir tradition and early scholarship views that as astrology as deeply problematic. And there are many hadith denouncing it in the Sunni corpus, denouncing astrology. In the Shia corpus, it's a bit more complicated. Um, Niebuhr says people are addicted to astrology, not, notwithstanding this... Um, this denunciation in the tafsir and early scholarship. He does make a distinction between Sudan and Shia, which is very interesting. Also, um, Usama bin Munqid in his uh, very uh, you know, well-known kitab al-Tibar, uh, his kind of crusade narrative of his life and of memoir of his life and of the crusade period, long been of interest to crusade historians. Um, he notes that you know this kind of what he regards as a strange contradiction between the fact that his father has copied, you know, two dozen or something 
Quranic manuscripts by hand. Uh, you know, he's a very pious man at the same time as addicted to astrology. So, and Stans is not saying these tensions weren't perceived or that astrology and alchemy and the occult sciences weren't challenged. He's just saying, you know, if we want to understand uh, this period and in particular the place of the natural sciences in this uh, uh, in this uh, period on its own terms, which is really what Stans is trying to do throughout the book, um, then we must, uh, you know, we must explore this intellectual landscape and, and treat it. Um, you know, make that leap of imagination, you know, attempt to, you know, to, you know, learn some intellectual humility, I suppose, not um, not kind of disregard these scientists merely because we may view them as a scientific or, you know, useless or not in some way contributing to the Western uh, theological narrative or the kind of genealogy of, of uh, the scientific revolution in some way. Uh, I don't think I've discussed the fourth chapter or the fourth excursus, so I'll do that very briefly. Uh, oh, I have mentioned the, uh, sorry. Let's see what it says. Ah, yes, topic again. So, Usama, the, uh, <laughs> the theme of this episode seems to be that every time you return, um, the sound goes choppy. So it's definitely a problem on your end, which is unfortunate. Hopefully it'll be resolved by next time, inshallah, when you're back in the UK. Anyway, the fourth chapter I've already kind of discussed briefly um, these 28 manuscript libraries and their holdings and you know who is writing these works of natural philosophy, uh, sorry, natural sciences, and how did they break down by genre? I, again, this is something I discussed previously. The fourth excursus, if I'm not mistaken, uh, really um, explores uh, the, uh, it looks like Usama will have to absent himself uh, permanently he says I can still check up on you in the chat. Uh, anyway, um, the fourth chapter, sorry, the fourth excursus is really about the the centrality of Sufism uh, to uh, intellectual life, especially in this period. I think Kuhn, uh, sorry, not, <laughs> not Thomas Kuhn, Stas Paps goes overboard, if I understand it correctly, in saying that from the 11th and 12th centuries with the spread of the Sufi Turuk from that period on, you know, it becomes hard to distinguish Islam and Sufism as though they're, you know, in the intellectual landscape of Islam. I mean, I would actually date this development much later than the 13th and 14th century, and the Maghrib definitely much later than the Mashrib, you know, by, by a period of several centuries. Because in the, in the um, 11th and 12th centuries, you know, we still have, I mean, the work of Ghazali, for example. Ghazali is clearly an apologist for Sufism. He is, uh, you know, evidently dealing with, um, yeah, so Sam will post his questions on the chat. Um, Ghazali and, and, you know, the great handbooks of Hushayri um, in the fifth Islamic century corresponding to the 11th Gregorian century, if I'm not mistaken. I mean, the, these are apologetic works and they're, they're still fighting their way into the mainstream. Or I'd, I'm arguing that Sufism is part of the mainstream. So I would date this uh, development somewhat later. However, Certainly by the 19th century, he says, um, you know, it becomes possible for the first time in many centuries to make this distinction uh, between Sufism and Islam. And uh, that should not blind us to the, the just the complete ubiquity uh, of Sufism in, in the intellectual history of this period. You know, um, in, Moroccan, in the Moroccan context, the Shadali Tariqah is particularly dominant. And all the figures we're looking at are kind of Maliki Ashari's. Asharism, he says in the introduction, or perhaps in sorry, in the uh, in the introduction. So Malikism seems to be established in the Maghrib by the 10th century, but it doesn't appear to be widespread. It, it really becomes much more widespread under the Almohads and uh, Ibn Tumar, who dies in uh, 1130. We do have a, a future episode on Johann and Friedman's book on Messianism and Sunni Islamic thought. Uh, that will deal extensively with Ibn Tumar and his theological and legal writings anyway. Um, yes, so uh, I think I've kind of hopefully given a fair summary with apologies to the author for cutting out at, at times. I feel very guilty about that. Uh, of the kind of intervention the book is making, again, the natural sciences were cultivated in Morocco. Um, 
There may have been objections to some of them here and there, but these were mainstream. They were intellectually respectable. They were, um, you know, taught by and defended and advocated by major scholars like Al Hassan Al Yusi, uh, even some of the more occult uh, and uh, and esoteric sciences on occasion. Um, and the book, as I said, is engaging with these major historic historiographical you know, historiographical challenges that have really shaped how the history of science is done in the Islamic context. And um, he very, uh, I think, um, with great humility, acknowledges the fact that you know his own book, in some sense, cannot escape this tension. You know, it cannot escape the fact that it, you know it is also subject in various ways to. Um, you know, presentist concerns. You know, this book is part of the um, movement that challenges this uh, narrative of the decline in intellectual sterility in the post-classical period. And I mean, I find it's... Uh, huh. Yes, interesting. interesting. Uh -huh. Okay, so I'm just looking at Usama's Khan. Yes, so... Um, Usama saying, for those of you who can't see the comment, suggests something a bit like uh, this Islamist. I actually have a bump into a colleague working on this. this the narrative of an art. Ah, thank you for putting it on the screen. Um, and uh, I'll summarize it for, you know, if we ever get to uploading the podcast version. So you see, says of both instrumental and strictly, you know, textual sources of Islam, they're all, you know, religiously sanctioned and so on. Um, the Islamists have, or it's often attributed to them, this notion of the shumulia of Islam, and this is often regarded as an innovation of Islamism. What is it motivating you see in this regard? How does it sit with Roshain Abbas's contentions about the Dean Tonya distinction pre modern Islam? I should emphasize, of course, only so many things one can address in such a short uh, period of time. Uh, Stearns does engage uh, quite extensively with the research of Roshain Abbas on the Dean Tonya distinction. Um, he doesn't read his thesis, but he does read, uh, does uh, mention this uh, long paper on the category of religious. Stearns does not buy into the strong version of the narrative that religion is a modern Western category. No, he says, I, I agree with Daniel Bayoran that, you know, already in the you know, late antique period, especially the struggle between uh, emergent Christianity and Judaism and Hellenism, there is some, something like a kind of uh, functional equivalent of our category of religion. Um, however, um, that's not the whole story because it is in the modern period, he says, when you know, you can speak of religion as becoming a system of knowledge that has an impact on other kind of forms of knowing, like science. I mean, I'm somewhat skeptical of that um, of that distinction, but he he, he mostly agrees with Roshain. But he does say, in the context of um, uh, the, Russia, the natural uh, sciences in uh, 17th century Morocco, especially in the work of someone like Al Hassan Al Yusi, I mean this. This distinction is quite hard to make because these um, the natural sciences and fields like Islamic law and theology do inform each other at various levels, um, and perhaps more than in, in in previous periods, the distinctions. What you can say, you know, you can't say necessarily the distinctions break down entirely. Indeed. Uh, these typologies of knowledge do establish that there is some kind of distinction, um, but the, the boundaries are uh, very, very porous. Ah, yes, uh, Stearns, uh, th thank you for pointing out, uh, says that uh, he's responding partly to Suyuti's attack on, uh, on logic. I should say, I mean, he, uh, Stearns mentions uh, Goldsey's kind of classic, but also widely criticized paper, on the reception of the sciences of the ancient Salum and Awa'il, which kind of helped establish this narrative of a dark orthodoxy, as he puts it. Um, uh, you know, killing off philosophy and um, encouraging intellectual sterility and commentary mongering and so on. Uh, uh, Goldsey appeals to the example of um, Seyfuddin al-Amadi, 
Sonia Brent is just in stances, establishes that he falls out of favor for political reasons uh, rather than theological ones. And um, I mean, it's long been accepted uh, that logic was actually really part of the mainstream curriculum and Ghazali played the key role in introducing this and Khalid the Rayhab has worked extensively on logic and has demonstrated this. I should mention, however, a counter opinion of Mufti Ali. This is a paper in Islamic Law and Society where he does, I believe, a st statistical analysis of the scholars who are against logic mentioned in Suyuti's anti-logical work. Uh, so, so um, and he actually argues that opposition to logic was much more substantial and long-lasting than uh, than Roy had been the kind of new mainstream scholarly narrative uh, suggests. That that's something I kind of need to pay more attention to. But logic uh, works of logic were you know definitely part of the curriculum uh, in the post-classical period um, and were widely studied and commented on and. And Morocco is um, is no exception. I say that's hopefully fair as a summary of the work, and I, I do hope I haven't distorted too much. Um, and I'm happy to kind of take questions. I can <laughs> can always ramble on um, until <laughs> until the end of of the episode. But uh, please do post comments and questions. Um, so, and Osama, if you could perhaps elevate these to the um, so I don't have to keep clicking on chat, which takes me to a separate screen. Uh, if you could bring these up to the main um, main part of the screen so I can see them without difficulty. Okay, perhaps not. Uh -huh. Oh, good. Okay, thank you. Uh, so maybe you have questions, Osama. Perhaps others have thoughts and comments. I certainly learned a great deal from this book. And uh, Stearns is, again, um, he feels... Without these kinds of fine-grained surveys based on careful manuscript work and careful readings, I mean, the, the th third chapter or fourth chapter? I mean, especially in the, the section on Fahiris in the third chapter, uh, yes, uh, you know, is engaging in a very close reading of works on, um, on alchemy and so on. Um, so... Uh, Ah, yes. So Ahmed Mubarak, Ahmed al-Mubarak asks, I would like to hear your opinion on the recent debate about the decline of Muslim knowledge in the post-classical era. Uh, I mean, hopefully I've given a sense of how uh, Dr. Stern's book contributes to this debate. And to follow on from the point I was just making, um, uh, you know, without these kinds of fine-grained um, granular, I should say, histories of particular periods and contexts, Stern's uh, kind of uh, points out, you know, you, it, it's hard to then kind of, without lots of these, it's hard to kind of posit a grand narrative. Now, Stern's is challenging a grand narrative. Um, is he displacing it with another grand narrative? I think... Um, you know, even notwithstanding the, this fact that he says very clearly, you know, I'm I'm not, unlike Ruwayhe, but I'm not making very grand claims. I'm limiting myself to, you know, Morocco in the 17th century, some, sometimes somewhat broader 16th to 18th centuries. I mean, humans are storytelling creatures. <laughs> and there is uh, what Stan speaks of as a temptation to narrative or, the, you know, the temptations of narrative. Without some kind of story, you know, it's, history is just one damn thing after another, as someone famously put it once. And um, I do find it hard to see that Stans is not contributing to the, the counter-narrative, to the old, you know, uh, so-called Orientalist viewpoint, you know, against the client. So he is saying that the natural sciences were cultivated, they were mainstream. He does speak of, quote-unquote, intellectual vibrancy in this period. He says that we should understand, especially based on the last two decades of work, revising and reevaluating how we understand the cultural significance of commentaries. You know, the presence of, of, of um, commentary literature and um, mnemonic poems, uh, again, citing uh, Sonia Brentes, should, should be seen as evidence of intellectual vibrancy. There's a kind of clear pedagogical context to the production of this literature. It shouldn't really be seen as, as evidence of of sterility uh, since that is with us, or at least was with us at some point, I should say in the conclusion, 
there is what I feel to be a rather curt dismissal of his book, where Stern says that there are the, um, and we had an episode on Ahmed al-Shamsi's book, I, I kind of discussed it. Uh, Stans characterizes the, the, these uh, rubrics of scholasticism, quote unquote, and, and uh, esotericism as uh, dismissive rubrics. Um, so his is kind of, a, in some ways, a counter to Shemsi. It doesn't engage with him at length. It's just really this one single footnote in the conclusion. Uh, I should say that my own view is that Shemsi makes it very clear that scholasticism is not a term of abuse. It's simply, you know, although it, it was for the humanists, you know, in early modern Europe, um, the schoolmen and so on, uh, it is simply a description of a particular, you know, scholarly style. And, uh, you know, it shouldn't be seen as, as a kind of pejorative. So that's what Ahmed al-Shamsi says about scholasticism. Um, and as for esotericism, there's a certain amount of irony in that, in, in seeing this as a dismissive rubric, in that Stans in his conclusion is, is very concerned that <laughs> the readers will take away, and it's a wonderful book, you know, it's not a criticism. He's concerned that readers will take his book actually as evidence of a narrative of stasis and even decline. Um, because like Kushki, he is concerned to recenter and underline the importance of the esoteric uh, and occult sciences. I suppose it ultimately boils down to how one views the esoteric and occult sciences. And uh, I should point out uh, that I have it on good authority as of a few days ago that uh, a number of the scholars who are making these interventions defending the occult and the esoteric sciences are actually practitioners of things like magic. So uh, to some extent, we all have skin in the game. And uh, as we've discussed, especially in the episode of Ahmed Jamsis, Boko Sam and I both have skin in the game. I will leave it to Osama to speak for himself, but especially in the last year, and not least, you know, as a result of reading Ahmed al-Shamsi's book. Although it's important to, you know, treat the, um, you know, to take the intellectual history of, of these different periods, especially the post-classical one, and to treat them in their own t on their own terms and not to explore them as a hist history of great men and their contributions and so on, to recognize the importance and centrality of the esoteric and occult sciences and so on. That said, uh, I have come to ki kind of develop Maybe not historiographically, but I, I do have a sympathy for you know reformist figures who are denouncing astrology and, and magic and letterism and alchemy in, in the 19th century. And of course, you know these these things as Stones recognizes. Um, you know, it's not that the modernist or reformist intellectuals are the first to denounce them. I've I've trying been trying to look for since arriving at Riyadh the recently edited work of Ibn al-Qayyim. Unfortunately, I haven't been able to find it, but it includes a long study of scholarly opinion on alchemy. Uh, this is uh, Ibn al-Qayyim's Nasihat al-Aghbiya bi Butlan al-Kamiya. So in the view of Ibn al-Qayyim, and so people, scholars who cultivate alchemy are aghbiya or stupid or foolish and, you know, and what have you. Um, I remember we had uh, an episode a long time ago on the maqalat attributed to Abu Ali al-Jubay, and he says something very interesting, although Robert Morrison points out that the early Mutakalimun actually had different attitudes towards astrology in the Maqalat. Ah. <laughs> uh, Stearns uh, mourns the fact that he is not a student of the occult. I do wish I knew more magic. Um, uh, well, there's a... Uh, how is it? So the Maqalat, Abu Ali al-Jubay, or attributed to him, uh, there's actually good reasons for doubting the attribution according to Sean Anthony. Anyway, he says, and how I pray this were true myself. Unfortunately, it wasn't at the most classical period. So just putting my colors to the mask, he says, astrologers, you know, their ability to predict the future is so bad that most of them die of starvation, you know, because they're not able to earn a living and they're not, you know, um, unfortunately, that wasn't true. <laughs> And especially in the post-classical period, these, especially in courtly circles, these figures were honored and celebrated and made uh, made a great deal of money. And uh, as I said, I, I do find this very unfortunate. And that's in no way because I subscribe to, and I don't, you know, this teleological triumphalist narrative of, of the historiography of science. And, you know, um, all of history is, is 
culminates in, in, in Western science and, and European man and so on. It's kind of, you know, a Galian, a Galian view. Uh, you know, I, I, don't, uh, I don't agree with that at all, but, you know, I do side with those Muslims who are critics of branches of learning like astrology, alchemy, and uh, I believe, you know, men of conscience in all periods, one could find examples of denouncing these either as frivolous or in many cases religiously problematic. I mean, ast astrology, as Niba said, uh, is, is a very clear case of, for me, of uh, science that's deeply religiously problematic because it's kind of prognosticatory claims. Um, Tun Shen, his PhD, thesis kind of explores uh, more, uh, more about this, but I, I wanted to with the details. I think Wasama is going to ask a question. Uh, um, well, Sam, I'm going to actually um, remove you from the stream while I ask, because it might be that two things aren't working simultaneously. I'll bring you back. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, hi, Sam, I'm everyone. Um, I'm, I'm removing Ahmad removing from the stream in the hope that you can hear me, actually. Um, if you can can't hear me, I'm just writing, please let me know. Um, but uh, hopefully, um, I mean, we, we really apologize about the sort of technical difficulties. And uh, as we say, um, Justin, uh, please uh, sort of uh, indulge us for this week. And we hope to make it up for you at some point in the future. Um, Amor is, of course, the uh, sort of encyclopedic. Uh, oh, fantastic. You can hear us. So um, there seems to be some kind of, it might be um, Saudi Arabia does sometimes have certain restrictions in terms of the use of certain technologies. Um, for example, when we use WhatsApp, um, if we try and call on WhatsApp and Telegram, uh, I can't get through to I can't hear a sound. You can't have the same kind of interference that you experienced when the two of us were connected there. So um, oddly enough, we can hear each other, but it seems like others can't hear us. So we'll, we'll look into what can be done about that if this con continues to be a problem when I'm back in the UK next week. Um, my question, uh, Omar, and you can hear me, of course, while you're at the other end, is uh, yeah, a couple of questions. One is the sort of the skin in the game uh, question, which I uh, indulge quite a bit of because I am someone who is, you know, a... Um, we don't really have cards as Muslims, a card-carrying Muslim, a card-carrying Sunni in various respects. And I'm, I'm trained as I am in the sort of um, Indian subcontinent tradition, particularly Nadwi tradition, um, and I have teachers in the um, Arab world as well. And in some respects, I, you know, this is a comment I made in a Gresham College lecture, which I gave uh, last November, where... You know, I don't believe that there's no one with skin in the game. And I, I think, you know, most scholars today um, will more or less sort of <clears throat> recognize that this kind of a positivist conception of objectivity is not really tenable. But at the same time, um, I, I think that it's fascinating for me to see that uh, the various positions that emerge are uh, given people's, yani, uh, as it were, or people's um, sort of assumptions um we all are working on assumptions because we need to um, assume the correctness of our world view in order to say anything at all like at its foundational level uh, even if we can recognize its contingency we need to operate in that sort of a context and so i you know i see uh, the way in which you described um, justin's work and i look forward to reading it because you know unfortunately i've not had the opportunity to get uh, uh, get to the copy that you kind of sent me, um, uh, the ebook copy. Um, what I suspect, just and Justin, you can correct me if I'm wrong, is that look, if you're not a believer in the Islamic tradition or in the Sunni tradition or in the Shia tradition, etc., uh, you obviously will have a different set of presuppositions which you're bringing to the table. If you're a card carrying kind of positivist, which is kind of quite, even if intellectually speaking, intellectual history, no one takes it seriously, or in uh, sort of most um, humanities fields, uh, you know, positivism is kind of from yesterday it was destroyed in the middle of the 20th century, according to some. Um, it is very much, I think, our popular culture is very positivist in many respects. So a lot of people like, uh, you know, Richard Hawkins is of the world, or the pop scientists, which we very often engage with. And so I wonder to what extent, like, just uh, the the fact that maybe Justin is coming from a uh, perspective, um, you know, which doesn't presuppose 
the truth of Islam. He's basically trying to push back against these tele teleological assumptions about Western scientific supremacy, uh, which is a, a quite widespread movement. And unlike, presumably, I mean, one reads someone like uh, Melvin Kushi's, you know, encyclopedic output and imagines that surely there's someone who's engaging the tradition itself. Like, why would he be so invested in this tradition without also being a part of it himself? Someone like uh, Ahmed, Ahmed Shamsi is an intellectual historian who, um, you know, he is, uh, it doesn't show up in his work quite so much, but, you know, he is a Muslim himself. I, I'm, I'm going to assume about you, uh, Ahmed, you know, that you're um, sort of uh, a Sunni Muslim uh, being from Egypt to yourself. And, you know, you'll forgive me if I'm sort of misrepresenting you. But all of these actually have certain presuppositions that will be embedded. And what we're looking at in the humanities, in a way, I think this is quite good from a Kantarian perspective, is that these competing perspectives, competing presuppositions result in very different, you know, conclusions that we arrive at. I, as a Sunni Muslim, I mean, what I hope we do, and this is where my entire wish isn't realized, is that we should recognize that these are the presuppositions we're operating on, be very forthright about them, and say that, look, this is the metaphysical basis on which I am building, um, and we all have our metaphysics, so to speak. And, and that, I think that would make for, you know, more intelligibility um, between the different positions rather than people assuming. I think we still do in intellectual history very often assume, okay, intellectual history, you shouldn't really sort of, you can still write without thoroughly going through your own positionality, so to speak. You can still, and, and to be entirely honest, all these scholars whom I have read uh, in the field, you know, their scholarship is just so enriching. But I think um, if we try to situate, uh, we shouldn't do the postmodern sort of like, in my view, we shouldn't sort of adopt the postmodern sense of, okay, let's reduce people's scholarship to their personal uh, sort of presuppositions. I don't think that, you know, I don't advocate that position. I actually happen to, in a Macintarian sense, believe in truth. And I think a lot of scholars do believe in truth. People who kind of adopt the postmodern position, I kind of always find myself asking, why are you doing this in the first place, right? I mean, if you don't think any of this is true, what's, what's in it for you? So ultimately, I think even the people who very often will adopt a post-structuralist or, you know, some kind of postmodern perspective are adopting a, you know, through their practice of scholarship and their advocacy for certain positions, a viewpoint where they actually do, like, inevitably as human beings advocate for a tr the truth of a certain position um and you know right now we see that in the trans um sort of issue for example just as one example i think of people like judith butler and the op-ed piece that she wrote in the guardian maybe six or seven months ago and there's such a strong passion and i can only understand that maybe from my limited perspective as advocacy for a position of truth so uh, apologies that was a pontificating on my part if you will indulge me, I did have a question for you, if I can recall it now, because <laughs> I just went off on one and I'm, I'm kind of struggling to call it. Um, I think the question I had to a certain extent is this teleological conception of science uh, that we have in the West. I mean, what I really appreciate in what you've mentioned of Justin's work so far is that, you know, it's chipping away, it's a deliberate attempt to attack that. And, you know, you also signal that at a certain point, the notion of scientists emerges, right, in the West. Um, even that, I remember reading, um, I think it was EHR, so what is history, I can't remember that. But he says something along the lines of, um, you know, the, the, the word science in German, in French, doesn't have this sharp distinction between, uh, you know, positivistic science um, and, you know, hard sciences and, you know, the social sciences, for example. So in German, Wissenschaft, one thing. So, uh, and, you, you know, Islamic studies can be a Wissenschaft and there they make the distinction between Wissenschaft and Theologie. Unfortunately, I think that's problematic. Um, and that's that's something which I, I would like to construct it. But I just wonder, um, you know, if you think about the word science, um, and, you know, I had this allergy until I reflected on this for a moment and I'm, I'm embarrassed to say it took me a, a decade and a half to begin reflecting on this to using uh, translating ulum sharia is the sharia sciences I thought wait these aren't sciences these are ulum <coughs> in some other sense 
in modern Arabic, ulum means sciences very often. And so it would seem reasonable in some sense to translate ulum sharia as sharia sciences. But sharia is not like hard sciences. It's not quantitative. It's not, it doesn't give predictable responses, or at least in the conception I had. But then you realize actually science is just a historical category. It's just scientia, I think, in, in Latin or then going maybe even further, Latin Greek isn't great. It's just knowledge, as far as I understand, right? Um, I mean, I guess um, I, I would have to go and explore exactly uh, its root etymology. But my understanding is that term just means knowledge. Why deprive, uh, you know, by translating ulum sharia as Islamic sciences, you're kind of making potentially a statement contesting that sort of paradigm of Western scientific supremacy to begin with. And I just think that, you know, that's something which I will, I'm now self-consciously doing, uh, despite my previous sort of allergy because of my being sort of uh, subsumed within the hegemony of that concept, Western, modern Western teleological conception of science. I just thought, okay, well, I can't translate it that way. That's not proper. But that's, in my view, like the ideological power of modern Western teleological conceptions of science. Whereas what we can do is start to say, actually, no, you know, these are all just, you know, notions that human beings, labels that human beings sort of like play with. And this is knowledge, as far as I'm concerned, you know, that's more important than anything that modern science, this is my personal opinion on this as a religious Muslim, this is more important than anything that modern science has come up with, even if that modern science has come up with all sorts of conveniences, including the technologies we're using to sort of broad, broadcast this. So I'm going to stop there, but I, I just thought I'd, I'd, I'd say that, and I look forward to your comment. I'm going to remove myself from the stream so that people can hear you. And, uh, and I look forward to other people's comments if they, if they so wish uh, in the comment section. Thank you. Oh, uh -huh. yeah, there's a lot to uh, unpack there. I think we agree and disagree. Um, in terms of investment, I, I think I once shared this anecdote with you that I have. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, so uh, Justin is mentioning that, you know, the 19th century has given us these categories that we think with. Um, yeah, so I have on very good authority uh, that Wilfred Madelong apparently once said, uh, just one link in my snet between myself and Wilfred Madelong in this regard, you know, I could have uh, just, I could have gone into Chinese studies and become, you know, an equally competent scholar on that. I remember when I first heard that my, my jaw kind of dropped because I assumed that having spent many decades and having indeed been one of the major figures in, in the academic tradition of Islamic studies, you know, the idea of specializing in another field would be inconceivable. Uh, but apparently that's not the case. And I suppose in that sense, Madelon is not unlike the, you know, gentleman scholars of the 18th century who found a particular field interesting that may not have had any connection to their possible lives and just, you know, we can say that there's a certain naivete about this so we can be cynical about it. Um, I take your point about um, the contingency of knowledge, which is something that comes across very strongly in Stanz's book, especially when he discusses Kuhn. Again, he doesn't accept every element of Kuhn's analysis. Um, and he says that, um, Kuhn does, in fact, recognize the superior problem-solving abilities of science as it kind of progresses. Um, so, you know, Kuhn is not, not advocating this incommensurability paradigm, at least not in a straightforward sense. That said, I do think one must strike a balance. I, I wonder, Sam, what do you think of this? I mean, the danger of, you know... Um, shunning objectivist accounts of knowledge and you know, positivistic accounts of knowledge is just lapsing into relativism. And there's a kind of silla and shruptis, or skill and shruptis, not so out um, that one has to navigate through in the sense that, you know, if you don't accept some kind of shared standards, and this is actually a point I, I remember Ahmed Shamsi emphasizing, funnily enough, in a blog post, uh, critiquing Aisha Chowdhury's intervention in a critical historiography of Islamic law. You know, if, if, if you relapse into relativism, that basically means you can't distinguish good scholarship from bad scholarship. And um, that, I mean, that means there is no distinction between them. Um, 
And uh, that is, you know, something I think yeah, all of us uh, would not really endorse. Um, and that goes for good science versus bad science. I'm sure on some level, at least, you know, everyone would, would embrace, if in our actions, if not in our, in our words, a distinction. And Shamsi further appeals to this example of, um, you know, shared, uh, shared scholarly standards. I mean, you know, we are, and you are, Sam, and notwithstanding your training in this kind of Arlem, uh, Arlem context, you know, we are creatures and products of the Western academic tradition. And um, even for those of us outside of it, uh, you know, there have to be some, some kind of shared standards. For example, you know, I don't see any reason why, you know, notwithstanding difference of style and convention and, and interaction with the sources, there's no reason why um, a Moroccan student in the Qarawiyin uh, you know, couldn't pick up just an Arab, say, an Arabic translation of Justin's book and benefit from it and learn from it immensely. I mean, and, you know, contest things that he finds there isn't sufficient evidence for and agree with things he finds there is sufficient evidence for. Um, you know, there have to be shared standards on some level. You know, we, we can't be entirely incommensurable. Otherwise, there's no possibility for dialogue. I do agree that there are different standards, but there are also shared shared standards in these different kind of paradigms. To use the Kunian term, I, I don't think we should we should uh, should disregard those. I mean, I remember um, Ahmed Amin. Does Ahmed the Shamsi mention this? I can't remember. Anyway, um, Ahmed Amin in his uh, uh, memoirs, uh, when he talks about you know having trained in, uh, you know as a alim and so on. And then Azhari, uh, his first kind of encounter with, the, if you like, the critical historical tradition in uh, in Cairo, uh, he's, he talks a lot about, or well, a bit about Carlo Nellino's lectures on astronomy. And I remember what he really emphasizes is, you know, it's not that a Muslim doing the history of, history of astronomy wouldn't, uh, you know, also read the sources and also have some idea of historical development. Um, but the way they, the way these traditions interact with the sources is different. That's at least what Ahmed Amin says, and I would agree with him. But I do think it's important to emphasize, especially in this kind of globalized world, um, you know, shared standards, things people across intellectual and religious traditions can agree on. You know, I would love to see um, Justin's book translated into Arabic, and you know, um, I would love to see it find an audience. In the same way that Justin has, um, you know, quite touchingly spent time exploring um, Arabic scholarship, especially that produced in Morocco. I think it would be lovely if Moroccan authors were reading his work and responding to it. And, okay, it might seem a bit soppy, but, you know, what's wrong with viewing academia, uh, whatever traditions we come from, as a collaborative em enterprise that we can all contribute to in various ways? I mean, I don't... Um, that's not to say we'll agree a lot of the time, but I do certainly think we can we can benefit and learn from from each other. I'm sure that's something also that you agree with uh, as well. Yeah, so uh, that's wonderful to hear. Well, uh, Justin says I hope that the book will be translated soon in the next few years. Inshallah, there are actually a couple of presses that are really um, doing a lot of translation from English in Islamic studies into Arabic, like Shabak al Arabi and so on based in, uh, in Beirut, I think. They've uh, a couple of monographs. I think even Ahmed Shamsi's uh, second book is is uh, in the course of being translated into Arabic. Um, um, thank you, Amr. If you don't mind, I'm just, sorry, I'm, just, I'm gonna respond to you, inshallah. Um, uh, I'm, I, I thought, uh, you know, I, I absolutely just thought, wanted to give you a, a verbal response um, and, and uh, forgive me for having to remove you like this uh, constantly, it's really, um, it's, in my view, on a certain level and toward. <laughs> so you'll forgive me for that, inshallah. So I, I was, I mean, I absolutely agree with you. Um, I think, uh, so there should be shared standards, but I think what the standard, and perhaps this is me sort of um, drawing on actually some somewhat relativist uh, writers like Samantha and decolonial theorists and so on. So, I mean, you know, I, I like to read some of that work, even if I find relativism uh, extremely problematic but you know there's relativism there's relativism so to speak um and and i, I 
know, I don't want to be reductive about it as well. Um, what I say is I actually really appreciate the sort of work that Justin does precisely because it's chipping away at those, you know, um, problematic um, sort of assumptions of the 19th century. I, I like his earlier comment. I, I mean, you know, it's, it's a short comment on an online forum. He, he's written a book about this. So people should recognize uh, that it's a, a lot more sophisticated than that. But um, in short, it's all the 19th century is It's given us the categories we think of we think with today and it takes some work to get past them um and uh, science is one of those categories and I, I absolutely agree with that i think i mean i guess i'm somewhat influenced by mcintyre um particularly who's just with trash and embassy and i think that's one way of bridging that sort of um you know he does it i think in a quite a masterful way and def stout calls it his um sort of magnum opus um he basically says no we can actually have intelligibility across traditions um, and, uh, you know, that there needs to be a process of translation and he has an elaborate theory of translation. And that's why, that, uh, you know, that's the sort of tradition of in, um, comparative engagement that I'm actually personally very interested in. But I think when it's done on the assumption that there is shared knowledge in a less um, sort of nuanced and sophisticated conception of what shared knowledge means, it's very often the hegemony of the powerful um, telling people, okay, this is our shared knowledge and, and this is what we have to teach you and, you know, the disparities of power will persuade uh, those who do not have the same kind of, of power to be able to resist um, the temptation of just simply accepting that shared knowledge is what the, um, you know, Western Academy by default assumes is shared knowledge. I, I have to, you know, I don't want to keep you off the screen for any longer, but there's so much more that could be said. I hope this gives a sense of what, what uh, I, the sort of concerns I'm laboring under, there, um, but I entirely understand all of them. Yeah, I mean, um, you know, credit to, to Justin. I mean, the book asks, you know, while including this sometimes very granular account of particular fields of knowledge in your know, one particular fairly narrowly defined context, the book, of course, raises much broader questions of enduring interest and, and relevance. Um, so yeah, he's, he's done a great job of you know providing us with with food for thought, and I think the book deserves to be very widely read. Um, and uh, I mean, I, I I should say I also enjoyed his first book, Infectious Ideas, which um, I mean, in some sense, this the second monograph continues um, Justin's concerns with how, you know, how presentist agendas shape and ultimately distort, uh, you know, our understanding of, of intellectual history. You know, in that case, uh, put, you know, identifying figures like Lucena Dine Ibn Khatib as, oh, you know, he's a champion of rationality, he accepts the phenomenon of contagion and dismissing everyone else as sort of silly and obscurantist. Uh, you know, in the context of discussions of plague and transmission and contagion, very topical, of course, and given the, you know, hot pandemic. Um, yeah, so uh, I, I learned a great deal from the book and as well as apologizing to all the, the author for um, the technical difficulties we've been having throughout the, the session. Uh, I'd really like to thank him for his, for his book. I think it's a stellar contribution. And the one thing I, I should mention, I did make a note of, to say this, but I, it escaped me. Um, I think this, the, and not really <laughs> related to any of the points I've just made, but I think um, I've read a number of books and this is the only one where I've ever seen uh, someone acknowledge the help of an au pair in, in the acknowledgements and recognize them explicitly for their help. I thought that was very sweet and, um, it's not something I, I've ever seen uh, seen before. Uh, so yeah, so I, I, that's uh, that's that's I think a nice <laughs> a nice note to conclude on. Ah yes. So to uh, mention, we're going to have a number of episodes uh, in future and so on. Uh, from now on, we will be broadcasting on Mondays, six p.m. UK time. That's eight p.m. Riyadh time. Uh, next week's book is Elizabeth Lost's uh, Everyday Islamic Law and the Making of Modern South Asia.
and inshallah the week after that which is the 4th of July um, well that's that's my pleasure so uh, yeah uh, next week for uh, sorry the week after Elizabeth Lost's book uh, on the 4th of July we're looking at Johann Friedman's book um, on messianism and uh, and so on and, and Sunni Islamic thought um, the exact title escapes me, but I, I've read it. It's a, it's a really interesting book on particular claims of or claimants of Mahdi Shaykh, if you like, and the intellectual background to these claims. Uh, then we will break for Hajj because, uh, God willing, I'm going on Hajj uh, just a few days after the 4th of July. So there will be a brief hiatus, not as long as the one we've just had of several months. Uh, but we hope to have episodes, uh, time and, 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 and so on, uh, dates, sorry, still to be determined on uh, Jocelyn Hendrickson's Leaving Iberia, uh, Hadia Mubarak's recent book, and Aaron Roxinger's book. So once I've come back from Heswell, Sam and I will sit down and figuring out, figure out a, a date for each of these, uh, these episodes. But thank you all for your patience, particularly the author and... Uh, I think we will probably wrap it up there, Sam. Unless you want to add anything uh, before we conclude. Uh, thank you. Uh, <coughs> sorry. Uh, thank you so much, Hamad, for uh, a wonderful session despite the technical difficulties. And inshallah, um, I look forward to welcoming you, welcoming you back in a week's time. Uh, we will <coughs> more thoroughly vet um, the platform we are using to see if. We can get something which is which allows both of us on the screen at the same time. But I just wanted to conclude by thanking you, Omar. Jazakumullah khairan. And uh, look forward to seeing everyone in a week's time. Uh, and uh, with that, uh, wishing you uh, a great rest of the week. We'll now continue, inshallah, uh, on Mondays. Um, so please, uh, if you find found this interesting, please don't hesitate to like, follow, and subscribe, inshallah. Assalamu alaikum.